Welcome to Badminton Unlimited, your weekly access to badminton action and beyond. This week we sit down with one of the best double specialists of his generation, Christian Hadinata, as he nurtures the next generation of Indonesian stars. And we're in Bangkok to catch up with an entrepreneur with a passion for badminton, who's hoping to help the growth of the sport in Thailand. We start the show in the sprawling archipelago of Indonesia. With a population of over 250 million, it is the world's fourth most populous nation, comprising of more than 13,000 islands. We're here to find one of the legends of Indonesia badminton. Even in an era when the nation's players roamed the upper echelons of the sport, Christian Hadinata was a standout. At a time when the likes of Lim Sui King were flying the country's flag high in the men's singles, Hardy Nata was popularizing the doubles format. Well, I used to play mostly in the doubles category. It was either the men's doubles or in the mixed doubles. So there were a lot of people who said I was, to put it in football terms, the playmaker. Because in men's doubles, the game is very attacking. There's a lot of action at the net area. This meant I could set up my partner who played at the back of the court. We caught up with the three-time All England champion in Kudus, a regency on the island of Java. He was here in his role as head coach for Jarum Badminton Club, one of the premier academies in the country. He was casting his well-trained eye on the potential new generation of Indonesian badminton players. Hadinata was born on Java, in a small town called Purwurketo. An athlete by nature, he tried all sports before eventually badminton caught his imagination. At the time, players such as Ferry Sonneville and Tanjo Hock were blazing a trail for Indonesia, helping them clinch their first Thomas Cup titles. The young and impressionable Hadi Nata was hooked. These players were undoubtedly an inspiration to me, and it motivated me greatly to believe that I could compete with the best at the international level in badminton. Despite our less established structure, and even though we were not very strong, or our foundation was not as well developed compared to the European and American players, we still managed to be ahead. His desire to make it saw him leave Kudos to enroll at a sports college before eventually returning to join the club that would be part of his life, Jarum. Here he met the likes of Lim Sui King as he continued his badminton education first as a singles player, then finding his true calling as a duo. During our training sessions, I used to play every category, whether it was the singles or the doubles. But my instincts at that point of time told me that I was suited in the doubles category. It was a bold step for a young shuttler starting out in his career. Indonesia had established themselves amongst the elite of badminton as a nation that could produce excellent singles players. They were the ones that were getting the attention and the plaudits from admiring fans. This didn't deter Hadi Nata. He was determined to establish himself in the doubles. Indonesia, Indonesia had no champions in the men's doubles category at the time. It did not have a recognized or a set pair of men's doubles players who could play in the team events like the Thomas Cup. These were the reasons that motivated and inspired me to make a name for Indonesian badminton in the men's doubles event. It turned out to be the right decision. In 1971, he won the national championships in men's doubles, then collected gold at the Asian championships in the mixed. The following year, he won his first All England championship in the men's doubles. He repeated the feat a year later, but this time he added a finalist appearance in the singles. He would end up with three All England and a World Championship gold in 1980 in both the mixed and men's doubles. 
Add to this four consecutive Thomas Cup titles for his country, as well as countless regional accolades, and Hardinata is rightfully considered one of the best double specialists of his generation. The most impressive aspect of his trophy haul was that he achieved them with multiple partners. Yeah, so but this is a derhana, yeah, recep, yeah. Actually, I thought I was just an OK player. I used to give in a lot to my partners. I have been paired with Lim Sui Keng, Ichuk Sugiarto, Liu Spongo, and many more, including my mixed doubles partners like Imelda, Ivana, Regina, and also Retno. I did think of myself as someone who knew it all, or as someone who is more experienced in the doubles category. So every time I played with a new partner, I would make sure that I asked a simple question to my partners. How and where would you like to play? And I would just simply follow them. What he saw as a negative trait was actually one of his biggest assets the ability to sacrifice and play the more subservient shuttler. This desire to be a facilitator gave his often dominant partners the freedom to attack. Hadinata thrived in the doubles format, discussing strategy and ideas. My focus was always more on becoming a good doubles player, in which I always have a partner to discuss with and also to give and receive support and motivation. When you are a singles player, you only have yourself to depend on. For me, it feels quite weird to play on my own because I have no one to discuss the rights and wrongs with and also no one to discuss the strategies with. He retired in 1986 at the age of 36. He went on to coach both at this, the Jarum Club, and then at the National Team Training Centre. He now experiences the adrenaline rush of competition through his charges. It's quite natural that when our players succeed, it brings a great feeling. The success proves that the training programme we have put together for our players is going well. The most difficult and most disappointing is when we fail to achieve any kind of success. And when that happens, it becomes much more difficult. Now back full-time with the Jarum Badminton Club, he spends time nurturing the future of Indonesian badminton. He has also written a book chronicling his journey through the sport. If it's as compelling as his career, it may well be a bestseller. Did you know? The Wembley Arena hosted the All England Championships tournament for 37 years, longer than any other venue. In 1994, Wembley made way for the National Indoor Stadium in Birmingham, and the event has been held there since. I think my toughest opponent ever will be uh, Lindan. I really admire the, the fact that Lee Chung Wei has stayed on the, on the top spot for, for that long time and he's continuously, he's playing a lot of tournaments. He is the, he's the right world number one, you know, he's, he's stable at the highest level. He never enters a tournament without uh, giving his best. I have a huge amount of respect for that. I've always had a weak spot for playing in, uh, at the Stade Coubertin in, in Paris. Uh, the fans, uh, I love them there, but also the fans in Malaysia and Indonesia are what badminton is all about. The toughest thing about being a badminton player is probably the, the amount of pressure you have to deal with on your own. You can never reach out for somebody, you have to you have to look on, look in on the inside and uh, take it all in and handle it. 
that is a, that is great. That's a great part of the game, but it's also very tough at times. Never to be tired on court. The one thing that not that many people know about me is maybe that uh, music is actually a huge part of my daily life. Um, I like to play a little bit of music every day. Uh, I listen to music almost every minute. So I think I talk and listen to music more than badminton. On the other side of the break, we're in Bangkok to meet a businessman with a vision that he hopes will benefit Thai badminton. Badminton Unlimited has on occasions brought you stories of people making a difference in their communities through badminton. Earlier in the year, we showcased the efforts of modest tea shop owner Tangaraj Alanchalian in Bangalore, India, and school teacher Pham Van Vu from Hanoi, Vietnam. Both men dedicate their life to coaching children badminton in their village for free, and they do this with limited resources. This week, we're in Bangkok, Thailand, where we met up with a successful entrepreneur who shares the same devotion to the sport as Alanchalian and Vu. But this Thai businessman is giving back to Badminton Thailand in a rather different way. <laughs> Jane Piatat was a badminton player in his youth, but due to the lack of opportunities, he never reached his full potential. Although he moved into the corporate world after badminton, he never forgot about the sport he loved. Three years ago, he set up a badminton academy, a school fully funded from the proceeds of his business. 20 years ago, I was also playing badminton. And after that, after I, I, I stopped badminton, I was also doing business for the fertilizer. And my, after my business is going good, I, I will come back to, I need to come back to here for badminton. My club is started three years ago. My, my club, I have the 14 court and then uh, uh, I have about five players. After that, my, my team is brought and I have the player now from start from junior, about 70, 70 players now. And then I have my, my coach, uh, 15 coach for coaching. With the recent success of Thai players on the global scene, badminton in Thailand is enjoying a golden period. But with only two established badminton schools in Thailand, Piatat feels more can be done to groom shuttlers to become world-class players so Thailand can maintain their good standing in world badminton. Many players in, in Thailand, they have no chance because in Thailand they have only one club send the player to play outside Thailand. So we are like a, another way to help them to, to can play outside Thailand you know, for the tournament. I need to develop my Thai badminton, my Thai player. My goal is the need for Thai player play to have something from, uh, from Olympic or from World Champ, something like that, for give the Thai people happy, to make my king happy. He believes that competitive experience outside Thailand is key to a player's development. As such, granular badminton players regularly participate in international tournaments. It's this philosophy that has made his academy popular and his efforts have started to reap awards. I give them the chance to play tournament outside Thailand. When I send them for tournament, I pay everything for hotel, for ticket, for food, everything I pay for them. My budget one year, I pay about 25 million baht, 1 million US. After my player come here and train, after that I send them to tournament everywhere in the world. You know, and then I have, I think now about 15 to 20 player to send them to, to play outside Thailand. And also now they have the world ranking for the men, uh, for the women single, women double, or men double also they have the world ranking now. And in an effort to boost the coaching standards at Granular Badminton Academy, Piatat recently enlisted the services of former men's doubles number one, Kukien Kiat from Malaysia. 
school, he have more experience. I need a good coach for, for pushing them to uh, work, work, work class. So I need who can get to help this. Pietat's generosity doesn't just limit itself to the academy. He is now honoring Thailand's king's devotion to the game. King Bumibol Adulayadej has been a great supporter of badminton since he played the sport back in 1953. He has provided badminton facilities for the national players at the palace and supported players financially through scholarships. To show his appreciation for His Majesty's contributions, Piatat is holding a badminton exhibition tournament to celebrate the king's upcoming birthday. This tournament I want to do because my king gives they support badminton for Thailand badminton about 30 years, but nobody give back to my king. So I want to do this tournament for give something for my king. I mean, uh, for the ticket, I sell the ticket. I give all the money from the ticket, give back to my king. For the man singer, I have a Lin Dan and Chong Wei because I think these two players, many people in the world want to see them again. They have the big tournament, but Chong Wei never win Lin Dan. So I, I want to, to invite them to, to play for this tournament. And I also I have the world champion for men number and I also I have the world mixed number so from Indonesia coming to play this tournament. He's also investing in the competitive format. Despite the country's rising status in the badminton fraternity, it has very few international events. Pietat is hoping to change that. He has helped to organize two BWF sanctioned tournaments in 2015. And on first week of January, I have the International Sharon and the next week, I followed by the International Junior. I want to do this tournament because of uh, I want to give chance for Thai players to do, to do the international tournament. I think some Thai players, they can, they can, they can fight with another country, but they, they, they don't have money, enough money to go out of Thailand, so better we do the, some tournament in Thailand. And then I want to do international challenge because of uh, the, the big name, the big player cannot come because this is a small tournament. This is a good for Taipei to starting to, to, to for the international. Piatat's passion for badminton goes far beyond words. His energy, entrepreneurship and money is helping to shape the sport in Thailand. His vision and leadership is a welcome addition to Thailand as it plots a way to match the achievements of the powerhouses in the game. We're in the Philippines when we get back to talk to the Asuncion sibling duo about their success and how it helped popularize badminton in their country. For this week's ranking, we look at the women's singles. The top three are occupied by the Chinese players, with Li Shui Rui at the top of the pile. Thailand's Rachanok Intanon splits Korea's Sung Ji Hyun and Bei Yeon Ju at fifth, closely followed by India's Saina Newal at seventh. Spain's Carolina Marin is the only non-Asian in the top ten. And rounding up the list is PV Sindhu from India. Don't forget the rankings are updated every Thursday, so log on to www.bwfbadminton.org for the latest information. A few weeks ago, Badminton Unlimited featured the Asuncion Badminton Center and its goal in molding the next generation of badminton stars in the Philippines. This week, we're back in Manila. But this time, our focus is on the family behind the name, more notably, the brother and sister pairing of Kenovic and Kenny Asuncion. They were the nation's pride in badminton in the 90s and 2000s and role models for today's generation. Competing abroad brings a sense of pride. The fact that um, you have Philippines on your shirt um, means you're representing the country. So, so in, in essence, um, it's not just on court, but it's your overall attitude. Like, so for us, since we're, we love the sport so much, we always strive to go, um, to move forward to the next round. Because um, we sort of feel like um, it's not just for us. It also shows um, our fellow players and the next generation players that if we can do it, then they can do it as well. 
Kenny and Kennevik, or Vic as he's known, are the children of a key figure in the country's badminton fraternity, Coach Nelson Asuncion. A player himself in the 70s and 80s, he was a head coach of the women's national team in the 90s, and now the owner of the Asuncion Badminton Center. We drop by the city of San Juan to meet up with Kenny and Vic to talk to them about their pursuit of their dreams and how they are now giving back to the sport by shaping the next generation of players. At the age of four, I um, wanted to hit the shuttle already and I was able to do so. And um, I think it's been that way for years and years. For me, I think I just started um, liking the sports when I started playing it. I mean, badminton was the first sport that I tried, and then, of course, as you grow, grow with it, um, you, you get to like it more, you love it, and then eventually we, we, got, we loved the sport so much that we stayed there already. With the badminton blood running deep in the veins of the Asuncions, it came as no surprise that both Kenovic and his sister would come under their father's tutelage. My dad was very strict, um, coaching a team. I remember very clearly he would always tell us that since he's handling um, a group of kids, he would be harder on us simply because we're his, we're his kids. And um, if, let's say, he'd have to pick for certain players to be able to play in, let's say, a team event or certain tournaments, he would only pick us if we're really, you know, far from, from the other players. The tougher treatment that both Kenny and Kenovic received eventually reaped rewards. Kenny and her partner, Wiener Lim, became the first Filipinos to win bronze medals in the women's doubles in the 1997 Southeast Asian Games. The siblings started off in the singles and the men's and women's doubles disciplines. So it was by chance that both brother and sister were paired together in the mixed doubles. Since we were always together, training together, it made more sense to try out the partnership. So when it, when it worked, then that gave us the sort of the signal to move forward and play mixed doubles. The Asuncion siblings took the bronze in the 2001 Thailand Open. They became the first Philippine players to qualify for the mixed doubles and for Kanovic, the men's singles in the World Championships in 2003. I think that was our target all along. We wanted to do um, the best that we can, so meaning we have to qualify for the Worlds and then try to do good in the Worlds. And then as we actually wanted to be the world champions too, so we were really striving for that. And then when we qualified, of course, we're happy and then we tried our best to do the, um, as much as we can in the tournament. Kenny and Kenovic failed to make it to the latter stages of the championships. But in December, the same year, the duo nabbed bronze medals at the Southeast Asian Games in Vietnam. As the siblings' popularity grew in the Philippines, so the opportunities to promote badminton increased. In 2008, they launched a free badminton magazine, Badminton Extreme, the aim to energize budding shuttlers. We had to venture into magazine, and, and we saw the potential of the magazine that it is more long-term. It is something you can always go back to. The magazine was just a start of the duo's desire to give back to the sport they love. When they eventually called time on their career, it was natural that they follow in their father's footsteps as full-time coaches. We really love the sport itself, so after playing, you'd give back something to the sport. So we really wanted to help kids to do best and be the champions again for the next generation. There's a saying on the wall of the academy written by Nelson Asuncion. It reads, dream your dreams and do your best. Never doubt, never rest until that dream is yours. Kenny and Kenovic have certainly taken their father's words to heart and have realized their dreams. But there's more they'd like to do help turn the next generation of Filipino shuttlers' ambitions into reality. Before we go, let's find out what's happening on the international circuit in our Badminton Unlimited calendar.
next week on Badminton Unlimited. We're back in Indonesia to profile for BWF world champion and Olympic gold medalist Chandra Wijaya.